Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Harvey Weinstein scores a legal win, but asks a judge to halt proceedings in another case. The convicted movie producer says his health has dramatically declined. And a former FBI criminal profiler gives us an inside look into the mind of a serial killer. What we can learn about a violent extremist behind more than 20 murders. Right at an early age, with the abuse he was getting, he, he was destined to commit crimes. Plus, the defense rests for an Ohio woman accused of murder, but will the jury believe her story? Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Convicted sex offender and former movie producer Harvey Weinstein may be COVID free, but his legal battles continue. One of the women accusing Weinstein of sexual assault was, has withdrawn his, her lawsuit. A New York federal judge ruled that the woman needed to publicly identify herself using her real name in order to go forward. The woman who filed as Jane Doe alleged that Weinstein groped her at the 2007 Cannes Film Festival and lured her into sex acts in Toronto and Los Angeles. Weinstein is currently serving a 23-year sentence for rape and assault charges. He also is facing additional criminal charges in Los Angeles and has a number of lawsuits against him. His defense attorney is requesting a pause in proceedings in one of his civil cases, citing his declining health. Joining me now is Harvey Weinstein's civil attorney, Imran Ansari. Imran, always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brian. So Imran, I've looked at these motions. I've, I've, I've got them here. I've gone through them all. The gist of them seems that you wanted the alleged victim, Jane Doe, to publicly name herself. But I'm seeing a lot of detailed description as to when and where she say these allegations occurred. Los Angeles, uh, Toronto, France. Isn't it just simple to turn to your client and say, hey, do you know who this person could potentially be based on all these names and defend him based on that and you don't need her to publicly name herself? Brian, well, it's, it's not as simple as that. And, and the reason why we were seeking for uh, this particular plaintiff or any plaintiff uh, who has come forth with allegations of this kind against my client to name herself publicly is because there's a constitutional favor and the court's favor, a more open proceeding. Uh, and a defendant really has a right to know uh, the, the identity of their accuser, uh, to be able to put them to their burden, if you will, uh, in the court of law, whether you be a criminal case or a civil case. And that's really what we were looking for here. Um, this individual has made allegations against Harvey Weinstein. They're rather salacious uh, allegations against Harvey Weinstein. And if she is going to use the court system to bring this lawsuit, we, you know, based on precedent, based on uh, what the courts have favored, and that is an open and fair proceeding, we're seeking for her to file that complaint under her real name. And the judge in this case agreed with us. She ordered this uh, plaintiff to file her complaint under her true identity. Uh, she did not do that. Instead, she voluntarily dismissed her complaint against Harvey Weinstein. Um, and I think that's and important. Imran, I, Imran, I it's totally get message. that. It's, it's yeah. a confrontation clause issue, and I support that. But from what I'm reading, she was willing to give her name to, to Weinstein's team and Weinstein, just not to the public. So why push for more? You would have known the name, and so would have Weinstein. Because, Brian, listen, it's... A, it's, it's a, a public perception. Um, a, it's the access to the courts and, 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 and an open proceeding. And B, it really is a, a message, if you will, to those who are going to bring these claims against Harvey Weinstein that they should do so openly and under their real name. Why, Brian? Because, listen, he's not an easy target. We don't want people to think that Harvey Weinstein is an easy target. If you think that you can bring a civil lawsuit against him just because he's Harvey Weinstein, just because he's been convicted of this crime, well, no, if you're gonna do that, you should do so openly. If you feel confident about your claims, you should do so in an open proceeding. Um, and that is sort of a message that we wanna get across here, that if you're going to bring a claim, listen, he's not a sitting duck. He's not an easy target. He's going to defend these claims, whether they be the civil claims or the criminal ca uh, claims in, in Los Angeles. He's not giving up. He's vested in his defense, both criminal and civil, and he's going to defend himself against these allegations. 
I hear you. Now, as I said, Imran, this is not the only case. This one got dismissed. As you said, she voluntarily dismissed the case by withdrawing. There's another case where you're saying that you want the judge to pause because of declining health. And that case has a little bit more um, information or background. That involves Ali Cassano. What can you tell us about that case and its proceedings that going forward? Sure, Brian. That's the case of uh, Ali Canosa uh, versus Harvey Weinstein. We've also similarly filed a motion in uh, the case of Geis uh, et al. I say et al because there's a string of plaintiffs uh, in that case um, to stay the deposition of Harvey Weinstein. And why are we seeking that? Well, it's twofold. It's A, because he's uh, in a state of decline health-wise. And that was reported quite significantly this week. Brian, you heard about him having a fever. Uh, he was tested for COVID. Um, that wasn't a positive test. But regardless, um, he's not well. He is suffering from a multitude of health conditions. Uh, and, and we have brought that uh, to the attention of the court. Thanks, Imran. And now to Terry Austin with news involving lions, tigers, and the feds. A Netflix star is accused of inhumanely treating animals. And this time, it's not the Tiger King himself. Federal authorities say Jeff Lowe violated Endangered Species Act by illegally taking possession and transporting animals at his Oklahoma zoo. Lowe and his wife, Lauren, took over the zoo from the Tiger King, Joe Exotic, in 2016. Lowe closed the zoo in August and agreed to pay $100,000 in delinquent state sales taxes. The complaint accuses Lowe of inadequately caring for grizzly bears and ring-tailed lemurs, as well as burning tiger carcasses. And in other animal-related news, a pair of quick-thinking and creative emergency responders are being credited with saving a family's dog. The Atlantic Highlands Police Department was called out to a fire at a family's home in August. Smoke was coming out of the windows, and they knew some furry friends were trapped inside. One of the patrolmen moved scaffolding from the side of the house, while a fire chief grabbed a yard chair to help reach the second floor story porch where the dog was waiting. Body cam video captured the rescue. We got it, man. Just get ready for the pass, man. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We got you. You got that? You want to grab that? Hold it sturdy? I'm gonna pass it down to you, all right, bro? I got him. I got him. Just stand there, man. What a great rescue. Still ahead on Long Crime Daily, a woman on trial for murder wrestles with the idea of taking the stand. And later, hear from one of the top criminal profilers of a serial killer's reign of terror when we come back. Joseph Paul Franklin was a prolific serial killer who shot hustler publisher Larry Flint and targeted victims across the country based on their race. He died by execution in 2013. Law and Crimes' and Jeanette Levy has an exclusive interview with the FBI profiler who's written a book about helping to nab Franklin. John Douglas spent many years as an FBI agent, and he's credited with creating the art of FBI profiling. He has written books in the past, and he has a new book out entitled Killer Shadow. It's about Joseph Paul Franklin, a prolific serial killer. John Douglas, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. So tell us about uh, the latest book and why you decided to focus on Joseph Paul Franklin. Joseph Paul Franklin was really going to be a, a make or break case for me as a, as a young FBI agent at the FBI Academy, developing this new concept called criminal profiling. And the, the FBI's heads and uh, headquarters were watching from a distance. Uh, they heard about the research I was doing with serial murders around the United States and the cases that I was doing for local police. But I'd only been doing it for about three years. And then one day in October 1980, I get a call from uh, a, a Dave Cole. He's a supervisor in the Civil Rights Division. He say, John, we know you've been doing this research. We have this uh, offender named Joseph Paul Franklin. Uh, we don't know where he is. He just escaped now from a uh, from a jail in Kentucky. He's killed over 20 people. Do you think you think you can help uh, help us out? And I said, really? I said, 
I don't know. I said, I'll give it a whirl. So they said, come on up to headquarters. I went up to headquarters, got boxes of material, brought that back down to Quantico. But before I left, they even said, hey, hey John, uh, if, if you threw up this one here, you could be working uh, cattle rustling cases in Butte, Montana. So, uh, you know, do a good job. Did you just see a pattern there? Or what, what kind of led you to bring him together as the suspect in all of these killings? Yeah. Well, who, who put it together really was the, uh, the FBI lab and state labs around the country that put, put it all together through, through forensics. Uh, uh, so it wasn't that, because that's what made it so difficult, because you look, uh, you look for the, the M MO is different in every one of these cases. The signature was the, the victims. He was tar targeting a racist couple, uh, interracial couple, I should say. He was uh, targeting uh, Jews coming out of synagogue. So, so it was very, very, it was a very, very complex case to assess. So by looking at my, my role and goal was, was to see what are the strengths and weaknesses. They didn't know where he was in the United States. And what I said was, he'll be in Mobile. And uh, I went out and I, and I told them, I told them why. The, re, the rationale behind it was, is that this inadequate nobody, his only accomplishment really in life were the, the crimes that he perpetrated, uh, particularly bank robberies in the Mobile area. Plus he was married. Twice. And first time he was 17, married a girl 16, divorced after four months. He then at 27 marries a 16 year old girl, has a child. That child is in Mobile, Alabama. So, like a homing pigeon, I felt that he'd be gravitating back to Mobile as well as to, um, uh, to different blood donor uh, uh, places where he would sell his plasma. And sure enough, no student did the, those days was with teletype, it wasn't uh, uh, emails and that kind of stuff. Uh, the teletype goes out. The agent charge of the Mobile office says, John, he says, we spotted him in Mobile. You're right. He said, what? Banker savings alone. I, I, I don't know. I picked the city. I, I can't tell you. It's like, what, what's the address of a killer, you know, if you, when you do a profile? You can't provide that. And so got that information, and they flooded the blood banks and, and surveilled the banks uh, uh, and savings and loans. And then he was spotted leaving Mobile and he ended up down in Florida and we caught him at a blood bank. What do you uh, want readers to kind of take away from this book? When I go around public speaking, is they're interested in, in the type of people that perpetrate these crimes. And they think that it's very, very, uh, you know, out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary, the backgrounds of these people. Uh, the FBI today uh, need the public to be looking for, for signs of potential problems on individuals. Uh, because they don't, now you have the internet, you have, you have the internet, we don't, you don't have to meet in some basement somewhere like the Klan did and the Nazi party. You can inspire this hatred over the internet. And not everyone belonging to these groups will commit violence, but someone will observe action. Someone will, uh, out there, the general public, someone who, where this person has become obsessed with violence, obsessed with hatred towards blacks, towards minorities of any any shade of color, and and it's important, and so they, they'll be able to recognize some of these indicators here. Unfortunately, you can't you can't stop somebody like like Franklin. There'll be more Franklins. Well, John Douglas, author of Killer Shadow, I can't wait to read it. I'm really excited to um, dig into it. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much for talking with us today. It was a, a great honor, and uh, we wish you the best with this new book. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thank you very much. John Douglas's book is available in stores and online. When we return, an army veteran killed delivering a pizza. Who's really behind the murderous plot? Plus, a jury's verdict for a former baseball player convicted of killing three people with his own baseball bat, the life or death decision after the break. A former pro baseball player will spend the rest of his life behind bars for murdering three people with a baseball bat. Brandon Willie Martin was convicted of slugging to death his father, his uncle, and a security system installer. Prosecutors say he killed them in a fit of rage after losing his $800,000 contract. But his defense says he has schizophrenia and had a long history of mental illness. It was up to the jury to decide if he should face the death penalty for the triple murder or life in prison. Here was the verdict. Hey, the jury, the above entitled action, ask the defendant, Brandon Willie Martin, 
fix the penalty under counts one, two, and three of the amended information as life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the murders of Barry Swanson, Michael Lee Martin, and Ricky Lee Anderson. All right, I'll have Terry Austin and Mike Horobonics with me. Terry, let's start with you. Get right to the meat and potatoes. Was this the right decision by the jury? I do think it was the right decision, Brian. You know, we heard medical testimony that he suffered from schizophrenia, and several witnesses, including his own brother, testified that Martin was actually hearing voices. So, and, you know, I think the, the main point here is that anyone who can take a bat and brutally murder three people, one of them being his father, who was in a wheelchair, obviously has some mental illness. So I do think a life sentence was appropriate versus death. And let's hope that he gets the medical treatment that he needs while he's in prison. Now, Mike, we're talking about mental health disorders here, but no doctor actually took the stand to provide a medical diagnosis. How do you think the jury came to the, this decision without it? Well, I think what was very strong and what really spoke volumes to the jury was the fact the brother testified on his behalf, and I believe his mother testified as well on his behalf. And I think the jury really didn't need expert testimony. They saw a family that have lost enough lives, and whether he killed them, well, he did kill them. The question remains is I think the jury said, do we really need to have this family lose another member? So there's a little bit of irony here. Exactly. Yeah. And then the thing that came with the right, right decision. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and when we come back, a pizza order ends in a woman's strangulation. We take you inside the courtroom where past and present lovers point the fingers at one another. Stay with us for Gavel to Gavel coverage. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel to gavel live trial coverage. Watch the Law and Crime Network today. The defense has arrested in a trial of a Ohio woman accused of murder in a deadly love triangle. Prosecutors say Erica Stefanko placed a fake pizza order at a Domino's to lure Ashley Biggs to her death. Biggs was a retired Army veteran and worked as a pizza delivery driver. Stefanko's ex-husband, Chad Cobb, pled guilty to murdering Biggs and later helped to implicate Stefanko. Police discovered the victim's body after a neighbor spotted her car in a cornfield. The defense called the defendant's husband sorry, as their only witness in an effort to point the finger back at Chad Cobb. Stefanko left Cobb for, her, for his friend after he was arrested for murder. He was extremely frustrated with the situation and that he can't believe that it was happening, more or less. Did he ever threaten Ashley? Uh, not that I know to her person, but uh, definitely in conversation. All right. And what did he say about that threat? Uh, he needed her gone. What else was he going to do to her? Uh, he made a comment that when it was all said and done, that he wanted to keep her skull as a trophy. Did he say that more than once? Uh, I believe he said it on at least two separate occasions. Did he say this in your presence? Uh, yes, he did. Stefanko's husband also said Cobb called him shortly after the murder and said, quote, I effed up and asked to bring him a change of clothes. On cross, prosecutors asked why he only revealed this information for the first time on the stand. If I had been asked at any point before these last few weeks, I would have no problem divulging that information. Do you think that information is good for Erica Stefanko? I think that information is the truth, ma'am. Okay. And you didn't want to come forward and say, Chad said he did this, used it in the singular, not they or he. You just, you kept that to yourself. Until I was asked about it, ma'am. Strong testimony. Terry, it appeared the defendant was going to testify, then changed her mind. Walk us through how that all plays out in real life. 
Well, we don't know exactly what was said between the defendant and her attorney, but here's what we do know. We know she has a right not to take the stand, and that cannot be used against her. We know that they took an hour and a half to talk to determine whether or not she wanted to go on the stand. And at the end of the day, she decided, no, I'm not going to testify. And the judge confirmed that she knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently made that decision. So that's all we really need to know. Corbonis, you've been here before. Game time decision. The trial is about to end. Are you going to put on your witness or not? Do you feel like this was the trial that needed a defendant to testify, though? Absolutely not. I feel this trial needed not to have any defense put forward. I didn't think that was a good witness. The, this trial needed to put the investigation on trial, saying if you investigators and police officers were so reliable and did such a thorough investigation, why was this man able to plea guilty? to this murder without her ever being mentioned until years later when the person who pled guilty sent the letter to try to better his position in life imprisonment. And now you're asking this jury to believe those same investigators and law enforcement who did the investigation to say they could prove this beyond a reasonable doubt when they couldn't closest to when it happened. Terry, there's a lot of bombshells in this case. What would you point to being the biggest bombshell in terms of testimony that you heard? Definitely Cobb testifying first that he did it, and then on cross saying, no, I didn't have anything to do with it. So that was a bombshell, I think, to everyone involved. Mike, would you agree in terms of bombshells? that a pretty big one? Yeah, you couldn't even hear it after that one went off. Exactly. Mike and Terry, thanks for joining us, and thank you all for joining us on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.